Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Russia Disruption, our fourth talk on the subject, in partnership, of course, with the Phoenix Committee on Foreign Relations and the Malikian Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies at Arizona State University. So not only am I welcoming folks from across New Mexico, but of course, from across uh, Arizona as well. My name is Sandy Campbell. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Fe Council on International Relations. Thanks so much for joining us on this beautiful spring day. And I promise we'll, uh, we'll make your screen time worth it for you today before you all get back outside. Let me show you a couple of the upcoming talks that we have. Um, on the May 20th, which is tomorrow, uh, we have uh, Gary Sick talking about Iran and the United States security policy in the Persian Gulf. Next uh, Thursday, the 27th, we're going to dip into the relations between Israel and Iran, which is such a fascinating story. And we'll have all kinds of insights from Israeli journalist Ronan Dangur. On June 3rd, we're going to go into uh, future pandemics and looking at wildlife efforts around the world, as of course the connection between wildlife and pandemics is awfully strong. And then we will conclude this Russia disruption series on Wednesday, June 16th at 11 a.m. our time, which is 10 a.m. Phoenix time, um, with Vladimir Karamurza, who is of course an opposition politician and Boris Nemtsov protege. Uh, he serves as vice chairman of Open Russia, an NGO founded by Russia. Russian businessman and full, former oligarch Mikhail Khodorkovsky, which provo promotes civil society and democracy in Russia. So with all that said, let me now move to today's speakers, uh, and I'll introduce them briefly. First, uh, let me introduce uh, Jameson Firestone. Good morning, good afternoon, Jameson, joining us from London. Good afternoon or good morning to you. Nice to be here. Thank you for joining us, Jameson, of course was working as a lawyer in Russia during the uncovering of a $230 million tax fraud case. This discovery would lead to Jameson's colleague, Sergei Magnitsky's death, which we'll be talking about a lot today. Jameson is a businessman lawyer who manages, who has managed his law firm for over 25 years. He was a member of the board of directors of the American Chamber of Commerce in Russia for six years and lived in Russia for 18 years. He specializes in Russian law, sanctions, asset recovery, defense from extradition and defending clients from Russian criminal and civil actions, both in Russia and abroad. Sounds like you are awfully busy. <laughs> <laughs> and then moderating today's discussion is uh, Keith Brown. Good morning, Keith. It's great to see you again. Good morning, uh, Sandy. Great to be here. Uh, looking forward to this. Keith, of course, is the director of the Malikian Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies and the professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies at ASU. His research has focused on the Western Balkans, exploring in particular insurgent organizations, democratic activism, labor migration, and politics beyond nationalism. So Keith will be moderating uh, the discussion we'll have after Jameson speaks for all of you out there. Please type in your questions into the Q&A panel, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them uh, when the time comes. Meanwhile, let me turn everything over to you, Jameson. Well, thank you, thank you. So um, today I'd like to give you a 30-minute overview of the Magnitsky affair to give you some additional insight as to the nature of the Putin regime, what its aims are, what it's doing to us, and then we can discuss what we can do to oppose it. Now, keep in mind while I'm talking that I love the country that I'm speaking about, the people that Putin harms the most are Russians. And the sanctions work that I do isn't just aimed at making the West safe from Russia, it's aimed at bringing civil society to Russia. So let's talk about Russia today. We're used to thinking of Russia as an aggressive military foe or as an ideological foe or both. However, the truth is Russia can't compete with us economically or militarily or ideologically. Other than raw materials, it has little to offer. And if you aren't sure of this, ask yourself, what do you buy that's Russian? Chances are even your vodka isn't Russian, even Smirnoff isn't Russian. And what's the ideology of the Russian government or the ideology the world perceives it to have? There isn't one other than don't mess with us. So despite Russia's inability to compete with us and its lack of a competing ideology, we are engaged in an ongoing conflict. All over the world, Russia acts as a spoiler. It sows dissent and division, doing its best to make us dysfunctional and impotent. Now, why? And that's actually a key question. Because if you don't understand the why, it's not possible to counter it. So the regime's goal is simple. It seeks to protect its right to plunder its country and to enjoy all the good things the West has to offer. And it accomplishes this, this aim by sowing dissent and division so we can't oppose it effectively. And geopolitics, it's important, but it's not what drives most of Putin's policies. They're driven by domestic issues, maintaining power and maintaining wealth. 
So let me begin by showing you the face of Putin's regime and why it can't compete. So in the, in the 90s, Russia was this chaotic mess, uh, but the police and the mafia were not one and the same. The police wore uniforms, they couldn't do much, they had little understanding of post-Soviet law, they had no money and no equipment. Now the mafia guys, they had shaved heads, they wore track suits, and they provided protection to any business that needed it. And almost all businesses needed protection because the mafia groups were shaking down businesses as fast as they were launched. And the protection they were selling was of course protection from themselves. So it was in this environment in 1993 that I set up my law firm. And it was this state of affairs that Putin put an end to. And much of the credit that Putin gets from, the Russian, from, from Russians as being Russia's only option is due to his ending this chaos of the 90s. However, Putin ended the chaos, not by stamping out criminality, but by assimilating it. It was a long and slow process. And at first it looked like Russia was on the road to order, stability and law. And Putin claimed to be creating this dictatorship of law. And in a way he has, it's just very different than what people were hoping for. So Putin invested heavily in law enforcement, codifying laws, taking control of chaos and subordinating it to laws. And for a time, the tax police, mass commandos with AK-47s were the most feared force in the land. Not paying your taxes or at least being accused of tax evasion became the ultimate crime in Russia. Investment was pouring into Russia and Putin was Mr. Law and Order. So what happened? So in 2003, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky was CEO and majority shareholder of Yukos Oil, which was Russia's most profitable oil company. He was the richest man in Russia, and he was not known for being subtle. And at a televised uh, meeting with Vladimir Putin, he pissed off the boss by bringing up the subject of high government officials taking bribes. Now, Putin was livid, and he replied with cold and controlled anger, some companies, including Yukos, have extraordinary reserves. The question is, how did the company get them? And your company has issues with taxes. Now you found a way to fix all your problems and Putin went on to employ, imply that Hudorkovsky had bribed away his tax problems. Yukos was immediately hit with claims of massive tax avoidance. Hudorkovsky was arrested and it soon became apparent that the entire case was nonsensical and was being driven by a desire to expropriate his assets and imprison him. So what occurred was an old Soviet tactic, the show trial. Investigators, prosecutors and judges, they were tasked with giving the state the result, it, the state, the result it wanted. Yukos was taken and given to Rosneft, the state oil company. Hudorkovsky was sent away for years. And then they had a second nonsensical trial to add even more years to his sentence. So remember this pattern because you're about to see it happen with Alexei Navalny. So many, many at the time saw Hudorkovsky taking him out as a good thing. I mean, who cares if Putin crushes an oligarch? However, Yukos was really something much more than taking out another oligarch or settling a political score. It was the weaponization of law and institutions for the purpose of stealing. In this case, it was Putin stealing from Hudorkovsky, but from then on, Russian law was for sale. Anybody could Hudorkovsky someone. We called this corporate raiding. And for a price, you bought an entire case from investigator to judge for the express purpose of stealing their stuff. And it's a really horrible thing because the people who are stealing from you are the people you're supposed to turn to for protection. There was literally no way to defeat a corporate raid by use of the law because the law had been purchased. So you might be able to derail a raid through connections or politics, but never by hiring lawyers. And so by the mid 2000s, law enforcement had become organized crime. The, the flatheads and the track suits were long gone and law enforcement was the only mafia in Russia that anybody had to worry about. But despite this growing lawlessness, corporate raiding was not the world that my law firm operated in. My firm represented Western clients who were super law abiding, Clients who set up and operated businesses knowing that the FCPA was waiting for them at home if they misbehaved abroad. So they didn't pay bribes and they tended to avoid doing businesses with parties who did. And most of our practice was just setting up businesses properly, keeping them in compliance with Russian law. Most of the disputes we handled uh, were with government agencies who were either mistaken or who were trying to shake down some client in a rather crude way. And we won all the time and we got used to winning. So this was Russia in 2007. It was a time when my law firm had gotten used to being able to stand on the law and win. And when not paying your taxes was a dire crime. And when Putin was seen by most as Mr. Law and Order. And when Moscow and much of, and much of Russia was awash in money due to skyrocketing uh, oil prices. However, uh, since Hudorkovsky's arrest, corporate raiding had been evolving and expanding. Officials all across Russia realized it wasn't just Mr. Putin who could wield the law as a weapon. Government officials could use the system themselves for their own private purposes to steal what they wanted. And Russia was becoming an almost feudal society where powerful officials would take what they could, checked only by officials more powerful than themselves. Officials had, they all had their own scams, 
And usually they tried not to step on each other's toes, but sometimes they fought for control of various cash cow agencies or businesses. And when necessary, they pulled together to deliver whatever result was required by their bosses. This was the situation in Russia that made the crime at the center of the Magnitsky affair possible. And it's the situation that makes it impossible for Russia to compete with the West or China. When there is no law, people don't invest because once you build something, somebody else will steal it. It's not that the oligarchs and the officials stole all the money. It's that Putin's system stole the opportunity for people to build things safely. And so by and large, Russians don't build things. That's why despite the huge amounts of money that showered down on Russia during Putin's reign, reign your vodka still isn't Russian and nothing else you own is either. That's the real Putin economic miracle that Russia is still so poor. And this free for all is also why Russian government poisonings like, the, like Litvinenko, the Scripples and Navalny are also sloppy because when almost the entire Russian government is focused on making money, many officials aren't particularly good at their day jobs anymore. It's also why Russia doesn't seem to have an ideology other than cynicism. For most of the 20, last 22 years, the only Russian government uh, Russians have known has been a racket. And it's really hard to build an ideology around racketeering. So let me tell you about the crime that launched the Magnitsky affair so you can see lawlessness in action, right? So here's the crime. At the end of 2005, Bill Browder, CEO of Hermitage Fund, which was Russia's largest foreign investor, was barred from entering Russia because he had contested a bunch of share dilutions in companies that Putin and his cronies controlled. Now, Hermitage was our largest client at the time. And as a reaction to being barred, in 2006, Bill liquidated Hermitage's $4 billion portfolio of Russian stocks made $2 billion in profit and paid Russian profits tax of close to half a billion dollars. He then asked my law firm to liquidate his Russian companies. So in July of 2007, we were still plugging away at liquidating a bunch of empty shell companies when two groups of 20 plainclothes officers raided my office and the office of Hermitage Fund. And the officers were accompanied by uh, forensic tax accountants. They ransacked the office looking for companies that had paid a huge amount of tax. We had police accountants ripping the files off the shelves, scanning the tax accounts for companies that had made payments of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, this is really strange because normally the police would be looking for companies that hadn't paid tax. And when they found documents for a large taxpayer, they took the accounting records, the corporate documents and the seals, and then they took every computer in the office. And we had no idea why our office had been raided. The case that justified the warrant made no sense. And the officers had not limited, limited themselves to taking documents for that one company in the warrant. They'd gone on this fishing expedition looking for companies that had paid a lot of tax. So we kept trying to figure out why they raided us. And we kept trying to get the documents back. But the police kept stonewalling us and refusing to give anything back. Now, several months later, we learned what happened. The officers had given all the confiscated materials to a criminal group that had a history of obtaining huge fraudulent tax refunds. That criminal group had then used the documents they took from my office to hijack control of three hermitage companies that had previously paid 230 million in taxes. Once they hijacked control of those companies, they obtained a fraudulent refund of the 230 millions that had, that had been paid by these three companies when they had been controlled by hermitage. So in short, my offices had been raided by Russian police for the explicit purpose of stealing from their own government. Now, I mean, this was simply breathtaking. And it was done at a time when not paying tax was the worst crime there was. And there was simply no way that any of us could ever conceive that something like this could go unpunished. So at the time, my tax and audit department was headed by a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. And I'd hired Sergei in his mid-20s, and he'd now been with us for about eight years. And Sergei believed in Putin's law and order image and Putin was now prime minister under the newly elected President Medvedev, who was supposedly a liberal lawyer reformer who had just urged uh, Russians to fight legal nihilism. So with faith in his country and in its leadership, Sergei exposed the entire crime and testified against the police and the criminals who organized the theft. Those officers then imprisoned Sergei. They tortured him for a year in an attempt to make him withdraw his testimony. And failing in that, they killed him in November of 2009. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of how we learned everything, but suffice it to say that Sergei's murder was a turning point for Bill Browder and myself. I had worked with Sergei every day for over 13 years. I knew his wife and kids, and I just couldn't let this go. And Bill and I dedicated ourselves to going after Sergei's killers and bringing them to justice, uh, a decision that seemed crazy to my family and friends, but crazy situations make people do crazy things. Uh, as for Bill, his reaction was something like out of a comic book or a movie. He pulled a total Bruce Wayne, you know, billionaire businessman builds the Batcave and goes after criminals. He turned his office into some kind of modern crime fighting headquarters with a staff dedicated to exposing Sergei's murder and tracking the stolen money. 
His team of analysts and lawyers, myself included, we became investigators and crime, crime fighters. Between 10 sets of triple screen giant Bloomberg market monitors were 10 PCs displaying money trails, connections between police officers and criminals, draft criminal complaints, and uh, press releases with updates of our latest findings. Now, over the next few years, we were able to document not just the crime against us and Sergei's murder, but that this one criminal group had stolen over 800 million from the Russian treasury. We we're able to show that millions of dollars went to the officers who raided our offices and who imprisoned and eventually killed Sergei. Over 40 million went to the tax officials who had authorized the fraudulent refund. We we're able to uh, prove that the police who took the documents and the lawyers who created the basis for the fraudulent refund in court and the tax officials who signed off on refunding the money and the owner of the bank that got the stolen money were all friends. They traveled together, often on private jets with nobody else on board. And so I made a series of sensational YouTube videos financed by Bill that got millions of views in Russia and abroad, exposing everything. Police officers with millions of dollars throwing theme parties in prison cells, tax inspectors with millions in Switzerland buying villas on the Palm Island in Dubai. And we would release these videos in English so as to get the attention of journalists and Western governments. And I would release them in Russia, in Russian, through Alexei Navalny, whose blog had millions of, uh, of viewers. And they were a sensation. Alexei was sued multiple times by corrupt officials for disseminating libelous material. And he just sued right back, saying, why aren't you guys investigating this? People were stunned and outraged by our findings. And yet we couldn't touch anybody who was responsible. Every complaint we filed in Russia was forward for, was forward for investigation to the officers involved in the crime. Now, unsurprisingly, Russian law enforcement exonerated themselves and every single official and criminal involved. They said the tax officials were innocent and tricked into granting the refund and also apparently tricked into sending 40 million of it to themselves. They said the millionaire police officers came from rich families. Actually, their parents lived on state pensions and in shabby Soviet apartments. They said the doctors who, ordered, who were ordered to refuse Sergei medical uh, treatment weren't criminal, just negligent. And all this was really crazy because by July of 2011, we hadn't just made videos and filed complaints. We had official conclusions supporting our findings from the Russian Public Oversight Commission for Human Rights and Detention Centers and from President Medvedev's own Human Rights Council, and still we could do nothing. We were faced with the shocking reality that Putin and Medvedev knew what had happened, and they had chosen to support the people who ripped off their own treasury and killed the whistleblower. And that's when Bill Browder came up with a game-changing idea. So what do you do with a government that protects thieves and murderers? Now, the idea that Bill uh, came up with was the Magnitsky Act, a law that would stop the people who robbed the treasury uh, and who killed uh, Sergei from coming to the US and which would make their assets sub subject to for forfeiture and make it a crime for US persons to do business with them. Now, from that moment on, our focus changed from trying to get justice for Sergei in Russia to trying to create a legacy for Sergei, to create a new world order that would exclude people who commit heinous crimes from Western society. So it's simple, if you can't live by the rules that make Western society possible, then you can't enjoy its benefits. Now, what we didn't realize was that by doing this, we had just started a war with Vladimir Putin and the Russian government itself. Before this, we were fighting a corrupt group of officials who had partnered with criminals to steal and cover their tracks, uh, a group of officials and criminals who the Russian state wasn't lifting a finger to stop. But after the Magnitsky Act was proposed, the Russian state itself stepped in and declared war on us. Stopping the, the Magnitsky Act became a national priority and attacking us became the focus of a coordinated Russian government. Um, so now we come to how the Russian government acts abroad. The Russian government strategy to derail the Magnitsky Act was straight out of the KGB FSB spook handbook of active measures. It was a complete product of Vladimir Putin's world. Active measures are like viruses. They're a form of political wealth warfare conducted by disinformation, which is intended to destabilize, derail, and at times destroy a target. Now, if they could paint Sergei Magnitsky and Bill Browder as crooks, they could derail the Magnitsky Act. I mean, why enact sanctions against brave Russian police officers who are trying to bring crooks to justice and, and naming the sanctions after a crook? I mean, what are you, crazy? So let me show you what it's like to be at war with the Russian government instead of just a few corrupt officials. And here's where you'll see how the Russian government uses disinformation to try and change US law and policy. So in 2012, when the Magnitsky Act was moving through Congress, <laughs> the Russian Ministry of the Interior announced that it would try Bill and Sergei's tax cheats. Now that Sergei was dead and could no longer defend himself really didn't bother them. And it wasn't seen as an impediment to holding a trial. The idea here was to get an official court judgment saying we're crooks. 
At the same time, Pavel Karpov, the uh, police officer who created both the case to raid my office and the case to arrest Sergei, and who I made a star in a short video showing how he received $1.3 million for his services to the criminal group, this guy sued Bill and me in London for calling him corrupt. This police officer who earned $6,000 a year spent something close to a million dollars suing us, effectively proving our allegations about corruption before the case was ever heard. Uh, in fact, the case was never heard, and I believe that Officer Karpov had little involvement in it other than allowing himself to be used by the Russian government to attack Bill and myself on our own territory. After a huge outlay of time, time and money, the case was thrown out as an abusive process. But the idea of the suit, other than wasting our resources, was to attempt to brand us as liars. Now, simultaneously, the Russian news channels all began an all-out attack on us. One primetime feature revealed that Bill Browder had killed Edmund Safra, caused Russia's 1998 default, was an MI6 spy, that he had tried to take control of Gazprom to control Russia's natural gas reserves, made billions of dollars but never paid any tax, and then stole all the taxes that he didn't pay back from the Russian government and killed Sergei in a Russian prison to hide his crime. And finally, the justice uh, for Sergei and the Magnitsky Act campaigns were all smoke screens and attempts by us to protect ourselves from the honest Russian investigators trying to expose our crimes. And here we could see the logic of Russia's actions, the, the lawsuits. They were creating this alternate narrative. We're not only tax cheats, we're the ones behind the refund fraud that we reported. And the entire Magnitsky campaign is the smoke screen to cover our crimes. And this is actually what the Russian government would soon be peddling abroad. Now, just about this time, uh, a man named Alexander Peripolichny, uh, a guy who'd given me all this information showing what the tax inspectors had gotten from the, from the crime, collapsed during his morning run uh, just outside London, and he died vomiting green goo. Now, he had been under pressure by the Russians for months to recant the evidence he had given us and to accuse us of the tax refund crime. And he had refused to do this, but he took the pressure seriously enough to buy millions of pounds of life insurance. Now, traces of Gelicellium elegans, this is a small white flower that grows in the foothills of the Himalaya, were found in his stomach. Now, that little flower is called the heartbreak flower. It literally breaks your heart by causing heart attacks. And it's not the kind of thing that people in this part of the world come into contact with by accident. Now, finally, right before the final vote on the Magnitsky Act, the Russian government sent a high-level delegation to Congress to blacken Sergei and Bill and lobby against the act, spinning the Russian alter alternative narrative. So this is what war with the Russian government looks like. A coordinated attack by official bodies of the Russian Federation, the Ministry of the Interior brings criminal cases, the state-owned national news channels uh, spins propaganda uh, and, and the release of this alternate narrative. And the Russian government delegations to Washington carry that alternate narrative to DC and call us crooks and lobby against the act. And it also includes these attacks by covert agents of the Russian Federation, such as the police office, officer suing us in London for libel under a case that it's unlikely he managed or financed, and the poisoning of a witness in London. Now, nevertheless, the Magnitsky Act was passed, and Putin threw a tantrum. He banned Americans from adopting Russian children, and he passed his own sanctions, barring uh, the Americans involved in the prosecution of Victor Boot, better known as the merchant of death, from entering Russia. So, however, after that, Putin didn't say much about Magnitsky sanctions for a while. After all, Magnitsky sanctions only con concern the people involved in this one particular crime and people who attack human rights defenders in Russia. As much as Putin disliked targeted uh, sanctions against individuals, the target we had hit was relatively small and didn't really threaten him and his, and, and his that much. Now that was all about to change when in 2015, we, pu we pushed to expand the Magnitsky Act to apply, world, uh, to apply worldwide and to include corruption as a reason for sanctioning. Now, you can imagine what a threat that was to Putin. The Global Magnitsky Act, if adopted, would pretty much make the entire corrupt Russian government eligible for sanction. Now, just at that time, Bill had provided the Southern District of New York with evidence of Russian officials money laundering, money, laundering, uh, money gotten from the tax refund through real estate in New York via a company called Prevazone. Now, this case was immediately recognized by the Russian government to be pivotal. The general prosecutor of Russia, of Russia stated, if Prevazone is found guilty, the decision will legally validate Browder's version of the entire story, from the embezzlement uh, of Russian treasury funds to the false arrest of Sergei Magnitsky by Russian officials. And it would support the necessity of passing the law named after him. Now, obviously, this could not be allowed to, to happen. And so the Russian government decided to kill two birds with one stone. 
they would use the Prevazone case not only to kill the Magnitsky Act that would make corruption a reason to be sanctioned, but to kill the original Magnitsky Act as well. Um, so essentially what the Russian government did was it deputized Prevazone's defense lawyer as a covert Russian agent and charged her with winning that case. Now the way to win the case was to argue and prove the Russian government's false narrative. Specifically, Prevazone can't be guilty because Bill, Sergey, and I stole the money and therefore Prevazone's money was, was, was clean. Now being a secret deputy of the Russian Federation gave Prevazone's defense attorney a great advantage. The Department of Justice would write to the Russian Ministry of Justice asking for documents for the case. And the Ministry of Justice would secretly forward those requests to Prevazone's defense attorney, and she would dictate the answers, which would come back to the DOJ as official answers of the Russian government. So we'd get the Ministry of Justice of the Russian Federation would like to confirm that Russian law enforcement fully investigated this case and found that Browder, Magnitsky, and Firestone stole the money from our treasury and that there's there, therefore no reason to provide any further documents because they're guilty. Now, this enterprising defense lawyer was a young lady named Natalia Veselnitskaya. And when she wasn't overseeing the court case or ghostwriting answers to the Russian uh, Ministry of Justice, she was also lobbying like there was no tomorrow in Washington, D.C. She hired Glenn Simpson, author of the PP dossier, to tell Congress that we were crooks. She flew congressmen to Russia to get the true Magnitsky story right from the mouths of the law enforcement agents who were charged with covering up the crime. And she even stopped off at Trump Tower to educate the Trump campaign team about what crooks we were and to cut a deal. Hey, Russia has dirt on Hillary and can help Trump win, and we want to make a deal. No sanctions for good relations. We'll even let Americans adopt Russian kids again. Basically, turn a blind eye to Russian criminality, uh, and Russia and America will have good relations. Now, that's all you really have to know about Russia wants. Okay, so as for our story, we exposed Veselnitskaya as a, as a covert foreign agent, lobbying without uh, registration. The story of the Trump Tower meeting broke in the New York Times. The entire Prevazone defense team was disqualified, and Prevazone settled with the U.S. government paying almost $6 million, unfortunately, without an admission of guilt. Veselnitskaya has been exposed and indicted, but unfortunately she's safely in Russia and the Global Magnitsky Act got passed. A bit later at the Helsinki summit between uh, Putin and Trump, Putin offered Trump another deal. You wanna interrogate the guys who you claim hacked the, your election? Fine, just hang over Browder and company to our investigators. Now, thankfully sanity eventually prevailed and the offer of trading us to the Russians was declined, but that's the level where the Magnitsky Act is and the priority that Putin attaches to it. Now, this has been a short summary, but I want you to know that on the basis of the fraudulent Russian judgment against Bill and Sergei and this false narrative, Russia constantly issues red notices and other arrest orders for Bill through Interpol and tries to have him arrested and extradited. Russia recently came within a hair's breadth of taking presidency of Interpol. Now, it's absurd and scary that the world would ever allow a corrupt government like Russia to head an organization like Interpol. Bill has been sued in the UK under fake Russian cases uh, with the aim of freezing all his money so that he won't be able to continue our work. Thankfully, we exposed and defeated that case. Laundered money we've frozen in Switzerland might be returned, even though Swiss prosecutors were caught ta being taken bear hunting in Russia by the Russian counterparts and being gifted sets of Russian porcelain that cost $10,000. $10, uh, so when you look at how Russia conducted itself in the Magnitsky affair, you understand Putin's Russia. All of what I've described uh, was done initially by corrupt Russian officials, but eventually the fight was taken up by the Russian government itself. All of it was done to, provide, uh, to preserve the right of officials to rob their own till and to steal from their own people. None of this was done for ideological reasons. None of this was done to take something tangible of ours. It was all done because Putin and his officials and their partners in organized crime want the freedom to do as they please at home and abroad. They have no regard for what their actions do to the institutions that they're a part of or standing before, because for Putin and his regime, institutions are never independent. They're tools to be used and things to be gamed. They treat international institutions and our institutions the same way that they treat their own with zero respect and as tools to deliver the, their desired result. So that's Russia today. Russia today. Uh, the Putin regime doesn't want to conquer us. There's no way it can bury us like Khrushchev wanted to. And most of the time, it doesn't even want to destroy us. It just wants to enjoy the fruits of its criminal labors on our territory and to play by its own rules internationally and on our turf. And when we take measures to prevent that, not because the idea, not only because the idea offends us, but because we have to, because it's a, member, a matter of self-defense, 
because we don't want our systems and our institutions to become like theirs. When we do this, Mr. Putin takes measures to fracture and divide us, to make us a more hospitable hosts for, the stolen, for their stolen money and for their thuggish games. So a weaker West is good for Mr. Putin. Um, and unfortunately, as we all now understand, democracy and its institutions are fragile, a lot more fragile than we thought. And so the games that Russia is playing are extremely harmful to us and the damage is not easy to undo. And so <laughs> here's the question. What do you do when a state with nuclear weapons falls under criminal control and claims the right to rob and subjugate its own people and is willing to cause mayhem in the West because it also reserves the right to hoard and spend the proceeds of crime in our jurisdictions. When it undermines every institution it's a part of or touches, what do you do when that state sits on the Security Council of the UN and is a member of almost every international organization from Interpol to the Council of Europe, when it has treaties with countries all over the world that presuppose good faith where there is none? How do you not only encourage better behavior to its own people, but contain that country's disrespect for law and stop it from corrupting our institutions? How do you encourage it not to act as a spoiler and as a source of discourse and disunity? So as I explained, we've turned to sanctions as one answer. And I'm proud to say that the Magnitsky sanctions are being adopted by governments all over the world. However, sanctions will not solve every problem. And for sanctions to work, there has to be a lot of thought and coordination applied. Sanctioning 11 people when we're hacked or six people when Navalny is arrested, and then heaven forbid he's killed, sanctioning another six isn't effective. It's not enough to make Putin change course and it's not enough to protect their own systems. Sanctions are a way of discouraging certain behaviors. They can be individual, such as the Magnitsky uh, sanctions, which are essentially lifetime exclusions from Western society for doing things incompatible with Western society. Or sanctions can be of a sweeping economic nature, such as the sanctions against Iran, sanctions that would presumably be pulled if Iran were to change course. Sanctions can even be imposed against individuals who may not be guilty of anything, but who are being sanctioned to attempt to change the behavior of a regime. Now, the Ukraine sanctions under Katz are a good example of this, where the, U where the US can in fact sanction anybody simply for being a Russian official or acting for a senior Russian official or having business in a certain strategic area of the Russian economy, period. No connections to Ukraine needed or even individual wrong, wrong going, uh, wrongdoing needed. You can just sanction these types of people every time Russia pisses us off. The theory being that if you make enough powerful oligarchs and officials upset about what Putin's actions are costing them, they may get Putin to change course or they might get rid of Putin, right? So I would propose that the US, which has the broadest and most powerful sanctions uh, programs in existence, and the UK and the EU have lost sight of developing a coordinated comprehensive sanction plan for combating and containing Russian aggress aggression. So this is what I hope we can talk about today. And of course, any questions you may have about the Magnitsky affair itself, so thank you, and please ask away. Thank you, hear Jamie. Was, okay. You hear me now? Yeah, you, got, you packed a lot in there, so thank you so much. Um, and we do have some questions coming in. I appreciate the, the, the shape of what you gave us. Um, I, I've got a few questions coming in. I'm just going to start off by uh, the, your last point. Um, just the so you suggested sanctions work on the um, on the oligarchs potentially that that sort of being the theory of how that might bring about change. Can you talk a little bit about the um, I hadn't realized the link between the videos that you and Browder made and uh, Alex Alexei Navalny's circulation of those videos and of course he's continued to use that method. Can you talk a little bit about your sense of where uh, Russian popular opinion about rule of law is because there's clearly still faith in the in the idea. Well, I mean, lots of Russians have faith in the in the idea of rule of law. That's why tens of thousands of people came out for protests all over Russia uh, since Alexei returned. But a lot of Russians also um, are so used to living under the Putin system, and or they believe the propaganda. You know, where would Russia be without Putin? It would just be all dis disorganization and chaos again. So um, that's the battle we're fighting, is how to get enough Russians you know, out in the streets and protesting to say, this system's got to go. Forget about this myth that this is what gives us stability. We have the stability of a dictatorship. Um, and and you know, go out there and fight for something better. 
So that's that's sort of I realized I rolled in Charlie Tichy's question there. Um, then Barbara Chatterjee in the Q and A has a question, which really sort of again comes back to where you started, pointing out the uh, the sort of deep the, the deep fragility of the Russian economy, um, and just asking the question what the risk is of the U.S. economy, parts of the U.S. economy actually reflecting that as well. So the, the, the especially I think in, in recent times, um, a, a sense of some of the cynicism that you described also being widespread in the US um, and, and a kind of effective sowing of alternative narratives uh, in US politics. And, and whether you see that as a, um, a kind of outcome of what Russia has been up to or a kind of problem in de democracy more generally that, uh, th that, um, that systems break down in the end uh, through loss of civic trust? Well, I, I think that Mr. Putin has been practicing this for a long time. I, Mr. Putin has been developing alternate narratives to explain away everything. I mean, you know, why, why, why we've dismembered Ukraine, um, who shot, you know, who shot the, the, the Malaysian airliner down, um, absolutely everything. And um, these alternate uh, realities are, are very dangerous for democracies as well, so as, we, as we've seen. Uh, Putin has obviously interfered um, you know, in, in elections and, and, and tried to uh, create all sorts of, I mean, you know, they were out there on social media setting up demonstrations for and against for things, right? Um, so these, when you lose faith, in your own government, and more importantly, when you lose faith in facts, when facts no longer matter, when your facts are as good as mine, we don't have anything to talk about anymore. How do we talk to each other? A couple of questions, particularly about, um, I think prompted, and I was very struck, I, I just reread Red Notice and struck by the, the account there of, the, um, of how Pere uh, Pilichny approached you initially and then your, you know, then the timing of his death coming as Congress was voting on the um, Magnitsky Act. A couple of questions about the uh, how safe London feels, uh, and 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 also I, I, I guess tying that to uh, is the UK adopting any of these? I'm, I'm just thinking about the amount of Russian uh, money that is sloshing around the UK in particular, does the UK's departure from the EU sort of change what you're, you're pointing to about the likelihood of this uh, international collaboration around these uh, pathways? Right, so, I mean, first of all, the Peripolichny killing, he gave me all these documents um, to expose the tax uh, officials. He did that for his own personal reasons. He had been laundering their money. And then he made a few investments for them and their investments went bad. So they turned on him and kind of put the tax, the force of the tax inspectorate against him, causing him and his business problems. And so he dumped all this information on me to kind of, to be used to knock them out of their positions. Now, unfortunately he didn't really realize what he was stepping into because he became you know, a prime witness against the government's alternate reality, uh, uh, alternate narrative, which is of course why he was eventually poisoned uh, 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 in London. Um, how safe does London feel? I mean, you know, not as safe as the U.S. probably, but, but um, we've got a lot of people here who've uh, died under mysterious circumstances and some not under mysterious circumstances. As I mentioned, there are no mysterious circumstances about Litvinenko, uh, poisoned with uh, radioactive polonium by, by, the Russian, by the Russians and by the Scripples who were poisoned here and who lived, but an innocent bystander died. Um, and... Uh, but the poisoning of the scripples did, uh, in fact, make the United Kingdom take a different attitude finally. It finally got serious and said, hold on a minute. Um, as for leaving the EU, uh, one of the things we've done is we've passed our, <coughs> we're kind of free to pass our own Magnitsky acts now, right? So one of the things we did was we added corruption to the, uh, and this is very recent, this only happened in the last month, to the UK Magnitsky Act, so we can sanction you for corruption. So the UK has, as far as human rights goes, a very uh, weak 
uh, Magnitsky Act. And as far as corruption has a good one. The EU has a stronger human rights uh, Magnitsky Act than the UK, but as yet doesn't have a corruption uh, one, probably because you know, Russia can always buy some member of the EU to veto something so that it doesn't get passed. So that's where that is today. And a, and a related question to that from Nels Hoffman um, in the Q&A. So, so you've talked a little bit about the, the clarity of the, the, the dangers uh, to, to the world system. So is it as simple as, so, so what is it that maintains Russian leverage? Is, is it simply the resources from this kind of uh, financial robbery plus the natural resources? Like, how is it that they're able to sustain uh, international allies against this kind of uh, move that you guys are spearheading? Well, look, they have natural resources, they have money, and they have nuclear weapons, all right? Um, so that, that gives them an awful lot of leverage and a lot of fuels. I mean, right now they're building a pipeline to Germany, and uh, the Biden administration just announced that even though they're still under sanctions, they're granting a waiver so it can basically be completed. But you know, let's look at this, the situation realistically. Germany has to provide for Russian, I mean, for, for energy security, which comes from a lot of places. Now, before America became the largest energy producer in the world, we were buying our energy from people who were odious and using that money to do things that weren't in our best interest. So you know, the problem is complicated, but they've got a lot of leverage. Uh, so uh, Red Notice, again, I recommend that. And I believe there's a forthcoming uh, book from Jamie Firestone. Is that correct? No, actually, well, from, from Bill is putting out Red, uh, putting out Freezing Order. Okay. How, tra so, tracking so, down the money and freezing it all. So one of the things that struck me rereading Red Notice is um, the sense that emerges that um, the Obama administration was not a big fan of the Magnitsky Act, and it was it was a testament to the U.S. the workings of U.S. democracy that it that it actually got through regardless of administration objections. A couple of questions, including from Alexandra Humphreys, but also others. What happened during the Trump administration? Did that feel like a time when the progress of your work was able to move forward, or did you find that w w actually got in the way? Let's let's be clear about the Obama and Trump administrations, okay? Uh, both Obama and Trump were highly opposed to sanctioning Russia. Um, the Obama administration was, you know, with Hillary, was trying to push that reset button and make nice, nice uh, as fast as it could. And so we got the uh, Magnitsky Act in by going to Congress and going basically over the president. The same thing happened with Trump. If you remember when the when the Katza sanctions were announced, Trump said it was the stupidest thing ever, but he signed it because there were enough, you know, it had enough votes to, to withstand a veto. So it's Congress has been the great ally here. Congress's distrust of Russia um, has been our great has been our great um, <coughs> the great friend at our backs, and that's what's allowed us to get to get work done. And I think, you know, I think Biden gets sanctions, um, but I think that that's probably just because, you know, we can see what we can see. You got hindsight, right? To see what hasn't worked. Um, we had um, Ambassador McFowell speak at PCFR a couple of years ago, and um, a couple of the questions sort of relate to um, the after Putin what or, or what are the alternatives of Putin or does getting rid of Putin actually make a difference you you and Bill have alluded to the fact that you know Putin came in uh, as and then co-opted or, or, or embraced organized crime um, at this moment up until which he was he, he seemed like a champion against it so the question that Tony Fox has posed are there enough oligarchs or people with clout in Russia to move Putin in less nefarious direction? And do you have any uh, sense of Putin's succession strategy, assuming that he and those around him want to continue this model of governing even after Putin is gone? Well, let me, let me take them backwards. So Putin's succession strategy. Look, Putin's strategy is to stay in power. 
because Putin constantly refers to seeing Gaddafi, um, you know, dragged through the streets and how terrible it was. You know, Gaddafi was dragged out of his car, thrown over the hood of a Jeep. Uh, they took a pipe and they stuck it where the sun didn't shine. And his last words were, this isn't permitted, this isn't permitted. Um, and that's what Putin sees in his future. And that's why I don't think Putin's ever stepping down. I think his succession um, strategy is the, the guy who can protect Vladimir Putin right now is Vladimir Putin. Um, and, and so I, I, his success in strategy has been to prolong his term indefinitely, effectively. <clears throat> in terms of, are there enough people who can pressure Putin? So the answer to that is yes, but not under the way that Magnitsky sanctions and other sanctions are implemented now. This piecemeal approach, six guys here, five guys there, U US does its thing and Britain does its thing and the EU does its thing, that doesn't work. All right, now, now what needs to happen is you've got to basically come up with, you got to sanction um, two kinds of people. You got to sanction the people doing the bad stuff from the, from the judges and the prosecutors. You got to just put them all on a list. Every time you, you, you've got a team of prosecutors railroading Navalny, Navalny or his supporters, you get a list of all the people who did this, right? And all the people put them in prison and you just sanction them in all of our jurisdictions so that they can't go on their European vacation anymore, right? So these are low level people, but, but I promise you that when the first time you've got 500 judges and prosecutors and investigators added to the Magnitsky list and it's followed um, next quarter by another 500 or a thousand, um, people are gonna be quitting their jobs before they railroad a human rights defender and anti-corruption. They'll just be like, you know, I made enough money and bribes already, man, I quit, right? Because they, they, they want their vacations. Um, as for the bigger guys, the way you pressure them is you use, uh, you use CATSA sanctions. You just say, look, um, we're not sanctioning you guys, you, you, you hugely rich Russian people who are supporting this regime because you did anything wrong. We're sanctioning you because your regime is messing with us, okay? And those actions are causing harm. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw you out of our jurisdictions and we're gonna freeze your money in our jurisdictions. And if it really, really, really bothers you, then go talk to the boss, get him to change or knock him off. But you've gotta hit them and you've gotta, you know, there's this, I mean, the, Europe has this crazy um, idea of human rights where the, you know, where they go, we can't, we can't touch the children of the people who stole this money because it's not their crime. Well, it's, the proceed, it's proceeds of crime that those children are spending. That's what they're bringing into our jurisdictions. That's what they're spending in Kosheval. And by the way, you can go ahead and sanction people who've done no wrong because these people support that regime and they support its actions. And when Putin goes out there and, and invades Ukraine or messes with our elections, they're supporting that. So you can just say, hey, you know, we're not putting you in jail, but we're, we're taking what you have in our jurisdiction and we're not letting you, you come here. And it's all just frozen. If things change, right, we'll give it back to you. So that's my, um, my two cents worth on that one. Good, thank you. Um, so Irene Thomas has asked, uh, what's your, what do you predict will happen with the Alexei Navalny case? What, what, what do you see playing out there? A lot more criminal charges against Alexei Navalny. Um, you know, I think that the Russian government's aim is to keep him in prison uh, forever. Uh, I'm not 100% sure they want to kill him, but you got to remember, like I wasn't 100, I'm still not 100% sure if the intent was to kill Sergei Magnitsky or just pressure him a lot. The Russian government is none too um, soft and the, and the goons that work in these facilities that carry out its, uh, its wishes are really thugs. So Sergei went in healthy and, and his health broke down and he died. Alexei didn't go in healthy. Alexei went in as someone who'd been po poisoned by Novichok, a nerve agent. Now, to give you an idea, the Scripples have really, really serious health problems. And the police officer who touched the door, which because Novichok was on the door of the Scripples house, um, he almost died. And after a year of really trying, he had to retire. So, you know, Alexei is not in good physical shape before he went into prison. So they're gonna pile on the criminal charges. Um, I, I hope they try not to kill him. Um, but uh, I predict that he's going to be in prison until this regime breaks. And, and is there is there any alternative? <laughs> it is Pollyanna-ish. Is there anything that changes that? Uh... Yeah, I mean, look, the idea what changes that is is, is getting this get, getting this regime out. That's what changes that. I mean, look, there's always the possibility that 
you know, something happens like the Olympics, right? I mean, why was Hudorkovsky and freed? Why was Pussy Riot free? Why were the people being held, uh, the Greenpeace activists freed, right? It was all to put on a good face for, for Putin's big show, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, there can't, that something might not happen where Putin puts Alexei Navalny on an airplane or something and throws him out of the country. Um, but, you know, to make something change, this, this administration has to, it's not an administration, this dictatorship has to go. And, and that will depend on Russians opposing it. And a couple of questions just about your current, um, the status of your current work is just to clear something up. Diana Baker asked if you're still operating professionally in Russia. Um, and then the second question from Jill Newberg is, so what are the advantages of uh, making London your base rather than the US as you described. Right, so we have two law firms now. Um, we have a law firm in Russia that does not touch any of this stuff. It doesn't get involved. Uh, and, and I couldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't try to convince anybody there to get involved in this stuff. Um, and they wouldn't, you know, it, it, I mean, this, uh, so, so what we have in Russia deals with um, typical Russian legal work. Typical Russian legal work used to be, I'm investing in Russia, I want to open a company. Now it's uh, somebody stealing something, somebody stolen something, or, or somebody's about to steal something. Unfortunately, it's you know not as not as uh, not as uh, bright and fun anymore. But our Russian uh, firm does that that kind of work. Um, I. Uh, on the other hand, from here in London, I'm freer to do a bunch of other work. Now I get involved in that work as well, but I also do um, a lot of sanctions uh, related work. Uh, it's my contribution to this effort. So when Alexei Navalny, for instance, that's the last thing he did before he got on that airplane uh, to Russia, was he released a list of 35 people who he feels that governments around the world should sanction uh, to encourage a change in, P in Putin's attitude. Now, when you, when you do something like that, lawyers have to get involved because somebody has to put together essentially a, a submission, a dossier of what this person who Alexei has, what these people that Alexei has singled out have done and what are the legal grounds for sanctioning them in every jurisdiction. So I, I do that as well. I forgot if there was any more uh, to the question or not. I think that does. And I'll just, uh, then the last question I'll pose before we uh, close is again from Nels Hoffman, which I think ties to that list you just described. I mean, if Navalny dies in prison, uh, what would be, what would be the appropriate response? What, what needs to happen? Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good question. First of all, I, I, I would, I really like the appropriate response to be taken before Navalny, you know, gets killed in prison. I mean, the appropriate uh, response is really to do what Alexei Navalny asked us to do <laughs> and sanction these people. Um, but, you know, if you go farther, the U.S. has a broad range of measures it can take that it doesn't take. We, I mean, there are, there are crushing economic measures that we can take. We haven't taken them. Um, I, I leave those questions about the appropriate response uh, to Navalny's death to governments around the world, but it's not sanctioning three guys. It's not sanctioning six guys, and, it, and it's not enough to just sanction this list. So again, I'm going to hand it back to Sandy. I just want to say um, I so appreciate you taking the time not just to talk to us, but I also appreciate that you're out there doing this. I, I was, after I, uh, last night I was clearing my clearing through files in my office and I found an observer story from 2018 uh, when the trail goes cold on um, the, the legal case on uh, uh, Sergei's, uh, not, I'm sorry, on Alexander uh, Perepelmichi's death. And I just realized I'm, I'm, I don't have enough bandwidth to follow this all the time, but it's there and it's one of the pressing problems in the world. And it's, I would so appreciate your leadership and playing this role both informing us and the work you do also. So thank you. And Sandy, back to you to close us, to finish us up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating conversation. Jameson, let me ask you one final question, which is, you know, looking ahead to the next, let's say five years in Russia, are there any things that give you signs and feelings of optimism, things we should really be, be holding on to? You know, it seems like we have so much negative news, so many things, so many dark things happening in Russia. Are there, are there elements that you see that, that, are, that are important to hold on to? 
Yeah, look, I, I have a feeling that in your next session with Karamurza, he's going to tell you those, those things. But people are getting sick of this. Um, kids, are, kids have grown up with only one president. And they don't trust him and they don't want him. And what you're going to do as those kids come to age, to voting age, um, is you're going to have a real issue keeping this regime in power. And, and so I think that's hopeful. Um, I think that people don't want to live under corrupt, corrupt regimes. And, and, and in addition to that, Russian demographics really favor um, people wanting this regime gone and soon. And yet, you know, one of the speakers we've had a couple of times uh, for our Journalism Under Fire conference is uh, Ivan Kopakov, who's the editor-in-chief of Medusa.io, which calls itself the home of the Russian free press. And we see, you know, so many different ways in which, you know, the Kremlin is cracking down on the opposition and now going after newspapers that are not even in Russia and saddling them with all kinds of financial disclosure obligations, you know, is is there will there be the opportunity for kind of freedom of discussion amongst you know the next generation given that the existing platforms to communicate and understand what's going on are just getting harder and harder to uh, to access look i generally believe that people understand the systems they don't want to live in and sooner or later people take action about that i mean there's always people people are going to realize you know what they live under. People do realize what they live under. It's just a question of getting it to a breaking point. And I can't tell you what the breaking point is. And I can't tell you if it's a gentle breaking point or a violent breaking point. Um, but uh, the odds aren't, the, the long-term odds are not with Putin for being able to hold this together forever. Well, that is a fine sentiment to end on. James and Firestone, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your busy day. We really appreciate it. And thank you very much for having me. And thank you so much to Keith Brown as well for uh, excellent stewarding of questions. Thank you, Keith, most appreciated. And we will see all of you again uh, on our regular program tomorrow. We're gonna to talk about Iran and the United States, uh, but then uh, on June 16th, we will feature Vladimir Murakarza or Karamuza. I'm always getting that name wrong. We will feature Vladimir on, uh, on June 16th, which is a Wednesday at 11 a.m. our time, 10 a.m. Phoenix time. Be sure to join us uh, for that. And that will be the final stream in our Russia Disruption series. Um, and until then, let me wish all of you a great day and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye.